Barry came to me with an idea that he had in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. King. And he said, you know, we should do something. I know just the man to do it. I know just the, the reverend to make it happen. And I think it, this moment brings out Barry's inner hippie in him that allows him to <laughs> kind of reconnect with that past that was so passionate in his younger years and is now so vibrant for all of us here, certainly at Temple Shalom, in the Parkland family, and all of us across the city. And so I'd like to call on Barry to come forward, thank him for all of his hard work in pulling us all together, <laughs> making this special moment. So um, I um, was given the honor of introducing my friend Peter Johnson. And um, Peter and I have only met maybe three years ago, but we've known each other for 50 years. And um, every time we get together, we find common experiences and places we've been and things we've done. But the thing that I've learned about Peter over the years, and you can talk about, you know, member of, uh, of Martin Luther King's inner circle, his experiences there, the things that he's done since he's been here in Dallas. But the bottom line on Peter is, is that he personifies the dream and, and the philosophy that drove Dr. King and made him the great man he is. And if you want to know the influence of this passing down, first of all, in 1961, uh, as a high school student, I had the honor of hearing Dr. King at Mount Carmel Church in Philadelphia. Uh, it was sort of my, my introduction, and uh, at the end of it, they did if I had a hammer and I was ready to sign up. Um, and, uh, and, and then, uh, as I went along, I had the privilege of spending some time in, in uh, Alabama when I was in med school and getting to see firsthand what was happening and seeing you all sing reminded me of going to church in shorter Alabama and seeing people singing and 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 participating in the service and then and then they took me to voter registration meeting where I was the only white person there at any rate um, the thing about Peter though is, is that he personifies and I've learned that he really personifies and he believes in the dream of Dr. King and tries to live it every day. And for me that's a lesson for all of us to try and live the lessons of the things that we want to be. So without further ado I'll introduce my friend Peter Johnson. Shalom. You never know and understand how precious this moment is for me. Um, it's going to be difficult for me to get through this. Now, before you go any further, a lot of people out there need to hear your voice, nice and loud, for everybody. The Lord just told me I could talk loud. <laughs> um, First and foremost, I want to thank God for allowing each and every one of us to be here today, for allowing us to see yet another brand new day that our eyes have never seen before. Thank you to this old hippie. <laughs> Barry is what you would call a known troublemaker. <laughs> and brother, I love you for it. I love you for it. To Rabbi Paley and all of the staff and officers and members of this wonderful temple, Shalom, which is peace, means so much to me. There are a lot of friends I have in here, and that is impossible to introduce everybody because I learned a long time ago in black churches that long speeches make people numb on one end and dumb on the other end. <laughs> so I'm not going to be long, but there are some people I need to recognize. First, 30 years ago at West Hunter Street Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, 
Raph David Abernathy married me in my Dolores. And I want her to stand. D, where are you? Now I know y'all thinking how I got that pretty girl. God help me. Also here is my son and my daughter. Where are you all? Brandy? And where's my son? There he is. And I have another generation, my grandson, Trace. And I want to thank Cantor Avery. I can't sing a lick here. Yeah? You have such a wonderful voice, but her spirit is even greater than her talent and her voice. The times we've been able to spend, spend, spend together, she has never stopped smiling. She is the epitome of decency and love. Thank you for being so kind to us and to the Freedom Singers. Thank you. Norman, thank you so much. Cousin Ernest, thank you. And thank you to all of you all. If you notice the hoodies that they're wearing, the hoodies mean something to me. The pictures on the hoodies, one of them is a young Peter Johnson, and the other one is a young Reverend Herbert Wright. Thank God we are both still alive. Those pictures was taken on the steps of the Dallas City Hall while I was on the hunger fast. 1970, we sat on the steps of the Dallas City Hall for 18 days and 18 nights. Fasting, trying to get the city, the state, and the nation to come to grips with hunger and malnutrition. While I was on those steps, I developed certain concepts and sent them to a senator named Frank Church, who's passed on. Frank took my ideas. Today they call them Meals on Wheels. Today they call them food stamps. We know that there's a cruel, mean-hearted man inhabiting the White House. And we know that we are going to have to refight the struggle to do what God said. Thus saith the Lord. Feed the hunt. This is my words. This is God's words. As this man conspires against poor people, as he conspires to take food out of the mouths of little children, we must not be silent. I am just Peter. And uh, I started, Rabbi. And Atlanta, not in Montgomery, although I became close friends with Rosa Parks. Used to drive her around in my red Mustang, Linda. <laughs> and I could hear her saying, boy, if you don't slow this car down, <laughs> I'm going to tell Dr. King. <laughs> and Reverend Melvin at the Nanny Young was always threatening to take my car. <laughs> but God is good. And we have survived. I want to take a few minutes, and not long, to share a couple of things with you. First, I have my father's Bible. And in the book of Genesis, the 27th chapter, the 19th the 20th verse. This is just going to be real short. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him in some pit. And we should say some evil beast had devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. This dreamer 
was Joseph. And we're going to spend some time talking about <coughs> dreams and those of us with the audacity to dream about a better world. There are people here that I have to say thank you to. In this audience is Beverly Tobian. Like I told you, this is going to be hard for me. Beverly's late husband, Milton, brave and courageous Milton, decent Milton, traveled with me, worked with me, helped me to do the kind of work I do. I was in jail here, because one winter some years ago, it was nine degrees with ice and snow, and people living under a bridge. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to get a bus, go pick up all the homeless people out of the cold weather. And the government got all of these boarded up apartments. I think what we'll do is break into those apartments and move homeless people in there. Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> so we picked up all of the homeless people we could pick up, took them out to the government projects that was boarded up, wasn't nothing wrong with the homes in, took a crowbar, moved them in, turned down the lights and the gas and the water illegally. Seemed like the right thing to do. We went to jail for it. And I was in jail in Dallas. Milton Beverly was in San Antonio. He saw it on television. And while I'm in jail, the jailer came and said, you got to get out of jail. I said, I'm not paying no fines. He said, some man named Milton Tobigan has wired the money from San Antonio to free all of you all. This history, this history is so important to me. This long historical relationship between blacks and Jews to show you how important this is to me. A couple of hours ago, on this podium, stood Martin Luther King III, the son of our 20th century Moses, stood here with me today, taking pictures with our rabbi and other people. Martin couldn't stay because he had to go speak at a banquet, I think in Arlington. But I thought it was important to bring him to this temple today, only for a few minutes. So Rabbi, thank you for welcoming my friend Martin III to this temple. I have a lot of friends here who've done so much for me historically. Peter Lesser is here. Peter and my precious, precious Annie have worked with me, traveled with me, gone in and out of those de dangerous, dangerous counties in East Texas, trying to bring justice to people who could not fight for themselves. Driving in dark, dark streets, followed me and Peter and Annie, not knowing that we're going to live through these experiences. Peter, thank you so much for being my friend and for being willing to help me fight this fight. I uh, have a lot of stuff that I want to cover. But we're going to talk simply about peace and how important peace is, especially in this day and age. You know, I had a friend at Motown named Marvin Gaye. Marvin wrote that war is not the answer. Only love can conquer hate. I deeply believe that Marvin was right. 
We live on this little planet. If we don't learn to live together as brothers and sisters, we're going to perish as damn fools. If we don't learn to live together on this little planet, we're going to have insecure, scary men like Mr. Trump. We must move beyond color, religion, denomination, language, and understand that we're all tied together. Dr. King said in a single garment of destiny, wherever the garment is torn, it affects the whole garment. You need not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for all of us. It tolls for all of us, for we're all tied together. August 28, 1963, I was 18 years old and I had all of my hair. <laughs> I got pictures I was good looking. That was before I raised children too. Yeah, it was. I stood at the feet of Abraham Lincoln and listened to Dr. King share his dream with the world. As he shared his dream with the world, I stood there at the feet of Abraham Lincoln thinking, you know, we got to go back to Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. We can't dream now and then. But Martin said, someday America is going to live up to its creed, simply that all men are created equal. He talked about his four little children. One of them was here today. And he said he hoped that they would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now, Marion Webster defines dream as things that occur when you're sleeping. Sometimes these dreams are wild and almost impossible to believe. But just as Joseph, Joseph had these dreams, we must dream about a better world. We must dream how to bring people together. We must dream how to say no to racism and discrimination and sexism, and most important, to militarism. We must dream to say no to guns that shoot a hundred times. Yes. I grew up hunting and fishing, loved the great outdoors, the great outdoors you can see the magnificence of our God. Why would you need a gun that shoot a hundred times? What is a bump stock? I have no idea what it is. But I know that people of goodwill, decent people, have to say no to the gun industry, making money off of bloodshed. We have to be wise enough and strong enough to say no. Mark Stanley, my friend, was here, him and his wife. I know most of y'all know Mark and the tragedy in his family. Over the last 30 years, I have bought guns off the streets of Dallas. Over the last 30 years, I have taken more than 20,000 guns off the city streets. I can do that because I have friends like Mark Stanley. <laughs> so it's June 16th, 2016, I was picketing Mr. Trump, and I had a stroke, picketing him. And I told Mark, is there any way we can sue him? <laughs> no, look here. Y'all think that, um, look, he gave me a stroke. <laughs> 
And of course, Mark laughed too, but I was serious. I wanted to know why can't we sue him for this stroke I got here? Both my sisters and my brother, the judge, have come here from New Orleans. My mother was a maid. She worked for a Jewish family. We grew up with that family. When my mother passed, my wife wanted to know, well, why are all these white people sitting with us? Why are all these white people sitting with us? I say, well, they are Jews, but they are our family. You see, our two families have remained families. And nothing can tear our families apart. I have some Muslim friends here because your religion is your business. Here, we are all God's children. We all have to live on this little planet. Now, in this city, there are things we must do to deal with the ugly realities of poverty and hopelessness. There are things we must do to let the world know that we care about the least of these. I wish Martin could have stayed, but he was already committed to be somewhere else tonight. But in his father's spirit, I want you to know that the civil rights movement that I grew up in was Jews and Gentiles and Protestants and Catholics. And if you look at the Peter Johnson Freedom Singers, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, and we're trying to get us some Muslims to sing with us. <laughs> yeah. Because this is important that we show this face to the world. <coughs> by our promises that's made in the Constitution of the United States, that we must demand that those promises are lived up to. Martin today had lunch with dreamers, DACA kids, because we must let these children know this is not just your fight. This is all of our fight. This is about families and decency and treating people right. Yeah. Thank you. What the Republican Party wants to do to these children who have not done anything to be kicked out of our nation. My Bible tells me to welcome the stranger, to embrace the stranger. My Bible tells me in welcoming the strangers, sometimes you may not know, but you're gonna welcome an angel. So don't turn them away. Don't kick them out of our nation. Let's put our arms around them. Now, Homeland Security is threatening our mayor because Dallas is a sanctuary city. So I want the record to show if Homeland Security and the Trump administration comes after Mayor Rollins, they're going to have to come through me. And they ain't going to like that. You see, this is a sanctuary city and this will remain a sanctuary city, that we will stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. <coughs> that's, that's, that, that, the stroke, Trump, Trump did that, you know, that, he's causing this. I um, totally believe that he will do more to bring us together than we could ever have done ourselves. In Birmingham, Bull Connor done more to mobilize 
the community for us than we could ever could have done. If Jim Clark had just said, well, I don't care if y'all walk to Montgomery, we'll get out of your way. If Jim Clark and the Selma Police Department and the Dallas County Sheriff's Department had not beat us bloody on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, we would not have the right to vote sometime. God can take lemons as evil people give us lemons, make lemonade and even a lemon meringue pie. <laughs> so Mr. Trump will make us look at each other with a new eyesight because we need each other. We need each other to turn America <clears throat> away from this silly racism and divisions. How do you think I feel when Jeff Sessions is the Attorney General of the United States, the Justice Department where civil rights workers would run to over the years and make our case. It is the Unjustice Department today, led by known racists. We know who Jeff Sessions is. I worked in Alabama, Doc. So we know what's in this man's heart and in his brain. We must join together, walk together, and fight together, and stand together against the destruction of the Justice Department. This is all our struggle. This struggle belongs to all of us. You know, I am uh, concerned about now is not the time. Now is not the time is what they told Joseph. Yeah? Now is not the time. Now is not the time is what Pharaoh told Moses. No, now is not the time. Now is not the time is what they told Rosa Parks. Now is not the time for that. Now is not the time is what they told Thurgood Marshall. Now is not the time to desegregate schools. This is not the time. Now is not the time is what the leaders in Birmingham, the business leaders told Dr. King, no, now is not the time. Now is not the time what Donald Trump told Colin Kaepernick That's right. Speak on that. and black athletes. Now is not the time right. to talk about the slaughter of our young men by law enforcement. Now is not the time. Right. Now is not the time. Now is the time. Don't y'all hear me? Now is the time. When John Lewis, my friend, and students down in Tennessee took a seat at a lunch counter asking only to eat, they were told, now is not the time. Persistence is what changed the destiny of America. Persistence. Andrew Goodman, Michael Scherner, and James Cheney went to Mississippi to register voters. The Mississippi people said, no, now is not the time to register Negroes to vote. Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Schoenner lay in their graves with James Cheney. Yes, Died for the right to vote. As the Republican Party conspires to take this precious right from us, know that we have friends in the graveyard for the right to vote. Jimmy Lee Jackson died in Lowndes County, shot by an Alabama police officer who was beating his mama with a billy club. 
he laid his body across his mother who had been knocked down and the Alabama State Policeman shot him in the back of his head. James Reed, a young white divinity student from Boston came to Selma to help us. Took a walk one day, got surrounded by white men with billy clubs and pipes. They beat him to death on the streets of Selma for the right to vote. The right to vote is sacred with the blood of my friends. Blacks and whites, Jews and Gentiles, died for this right. Too young, too bloody, this vote we must not allow. Texas and no other state to take this vote from our people or from nobody. It is the foundation of what democracy is. Yes, I am a dreamer. I believe that those wonderful, wonderful philosophers from Liverpool, England, the Beatles, was right when they told us to use our imagination. Can you imagine a world without no AK-47s? Can you imagine a world where there's no hunger? Can you imagine a world where there's no hatred? Can you imagine a world where there's no homelessness? People living in the streets, can you imagine that? Temple Shalom, let me borrow your imagination just for a few minutes. Imagine all the people living Life and peace. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine all of us loving each other as Dr. King challenged us? You know, 50 years has passed. We are going back to Memphis in April, all of us that's still alive, to celebrate, commemorate this 50th anniversary. But I want you, Temple, to just use your imagination for a few minutes. Imagine there's no sexism and women are treated as equals. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yes, I am a dreamer. I hope one day you can all join us and the world can live in peace. My brothers and my sisters, that's here. When you go back to Plaquemine, to Abbeville Parish, from whence I have come, where the bayous run deep and the moss hangs from the trees and the mighty Mississippi winds its way through the heart of my hometown. When you go back home, Linda, tell them what I have done with my life. Tell them I have fed the hungry. Go home and tell them I have housed the homeless. When you go home, tell them I have had clothed the naked. And yes, tell them I have helped set the captives free. Yes, sir. If they ask you, what am I going to do with the remainder of my life? Tell them in the words of this old Negro spiritual, I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. Tell them, Linda, I'm gonna stay on the battlefield until I die. Yes, I'm gonna stay on the battlefield until I die. Tell them, I am going to treat everybody right until I die. That I'm going to treat everybody right until I die. And can tell them, I'm going to love everybody until I die. I am going to love everybody until I die. God bless you.